Hey, it's me, Vicky Marie. Good morning from Spain, and depending on where you are, good evening, good afternoon, good night. <laughs> depending on where you're actually watching for, I think that's just a notification for me. Yeah, so there's a few things we're going to talk about this morning. Um, still no news about poor Samantha, about her body being found as far as I know. Still no news. Um, but I wanted to talk about a couple of other cases that have got echoes for whatever reason about Samantha's case. Um, no, they're not, you know, identical, but they've got echoes. Hi, Amanda Jane. Hi, Kelly. Um, so I'm going to light my candle. Will today be the day? Will today be the day when, uh, we, you know, Samantha will be brought home? But the two cases that I just want to talk about, that I, I, I can draw some correlations between. Uh, one is uh, a murder in Ballarat, where a woman, Kobe Parfit, was actually found in a mine shaft. Finally found in a mine shaft. Her body was found in a mine shaft. And her murderer was caught and prosecuted. So I wanted to talk about that because I think that's relevant. One, because it's in Ballarat. It was in Ballarat last year. This happened. So in that same place. And two, obviously, because she was found down a mine shaft. So her body was found. So there's a hope there. You know, because I think we're sort of losing hope a little bit that Samantha will be found. And, you know, there's quite a lot of, you know, not nice rumours going around about what might have happened to her body and why it's not been found yet. Um, so all that is, is is quite distressing, isn't it? So hopefully, you know, at least Kobe's body was found um, and that does give some closure, doesn't it, to the friends and family? At least a little bit of closure. So that's what we're going to look at, the Kobe Parfit case. I will look at that first. And then after that, I want to tell you, for the, any of you that don't know, if you are Australian, you will definitely know about Ivan Milat, uh, who was probably, well, he's probably the most notorious killer in Australian history, isn't he? He's like the equivalent of the Yorkshire Ripper in Britain. You know, he's notorious. Everybody knows about him. He killed a lot of uh, people, but also... It's thought that there's a lot of other people that he killed that have never been, you know, it's never been established, that he's not been, uh, you know, prosecuted for. Now, he is deceased now, he's no longer with us. He died in 2019. So he will be paying for his, um, he will be paying for his crimes in a different way now, hopefully. Um, yeah. He died in prison. He got a life sentence. Hi, Ty. Ivan the Terrible, yeah. So, yeah, very nasty man. But the reason that I want to talk about him as well is, you know, the, the young lad that has been charged with Samantha's murder, so presuming that he is guilty, you know, we don't know that yet. It's still alleged, isn't it? He's got to have his uh, trial. And, um, you know... Might he have turned into a kind of Ivan Milat? I mean, is because Ivan was so Ivan, he was at a time when you know we didn't have the DNA uh, resources that we have now, we didn't have the mobile phone pings, you know, all the things that have helped to catch Samantha's killer and helped catch killers day in, day out. If it wasn't for that, you know, would we even now have anyone in custody for Samantha's murder? And, uh, you know, would that boy, uh, Patrick Stevenson, would he go on to commit more crimes? I mean, we don't know that yet because we don't even know how he killed her yet or what the circumstances were. But it was just something that was kicking around my head for someone like Ivan Milat. He really prospered because he moved from place to place. Uh, we'll see, like, what he did. He even faked suicide once, um, you know, to escape detection because he had a life of crime ever from when he was like an adolescent you know he was involved in petty crime high blind b you know a lot of these killers they start off with petty crime don't they and then build up to more serious crimes as they get older 
Oh my God, Kelly. So Kelly says her English work colleague knows someone who, who thinks she hitched a lift with Ivan years ago. My God, how terrifying. Yeah, because he probably won't have killed everybody that he picked up. It probably depended on a few things. Maybe even just what mood he was in that day, whether he liked the person or not. Um, you know, the, the other one who did that was the co-ed killer, Ed Kemper. He did loads of practice runs before he actually murdered anybody, picking up girls and hitchhiking co-eds. Um, and so I'm sure there's a lot of women out there who look back and realise that they were in the car with Edmund Kemper, who went on to sort of murder many women, um, many young girls. You know, it's 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 quite sort of chilling, isn't it, to think that you may have um, you may have been in a car with that person. Anyway, we're going to look at him second. First of all, I just want to look at this case of Kobe, uh, Kobe Parfit, because this. I think should let us keep, you know, because as I say, every every morning, every time I come onto the computer, I light this candle and, you know, but it, uh, God knows how Samantha's family feels because it does feel more, um, you know, I don't know, every day that goes past, it feels a bit depressing, doesn't it, as to whether we are going to, uh, whether Sam is coming home, you know, and we mustn't lose hope. Uh, but very, very, um, it's difficult not to lose hope, isn't it? And all the family will be wanting now for comfort is to bring Sam's body home and give her a decent burial. Now, and, you know, and a farewell because I've not a chance to say goodbye to her properly. So let's have a look at this case of Kobe Parfit. And poor Kobe, uh, you know, she was a mother of four. Let me just. So let me share this. Hang on. So, yeah, I had a brief look at it the other day, but I didn't know enough about it that I felt to talk about. It. So I've researched it a bit now. And, um, yeah, it's, this is a, it, it's awful. So this poor woman who's a mother of four, was killed by her friend, a, a woman, another woman, uh, Shanann. And um, she died, she was killed on April the 28th in 2020. So it's a fairly recent case. Um, and then what that, what this woman did, let's see if it is the picture on here. I've got a picture of uh, the perpetrator, but it's on another article. Let's just read this article first. So she was killed at home and she she knew that this person was after her. Uh, she sent messages uh, to her friends saying how scared she was, that she kept saying that they, whoever they were, were doing laps around her house and she felt that one day they would, they would catch her on her own. She knew that, that she was in danger for them. Now, I'm not sure why she didn't go to the police or maybe she did go to the police. There's some sort of drug involvement in this, so maybe she didn't want to go to the police. But um, anyway, finally, on April the 28th, 2020, Shannon Jeffrey assaulted her, fatally assaulted in her, her in her home. But because she put her down the mine shaft, it was eight months before she was found. Eight months. So, But she was found, so we've got to cling on to that. Um, her body was found down a mine shaft. So, you know, the guy, uh, is it Raymond, the mine shaft expert? He says he's going to carry on going down these mine shafts, and good for him because she, uh, Samantha may well be down one, might she? So, this uh, horrible woman, a twonkess, if you like, or a twonkett, uh, Shannon, she'd been in prison. She'd only been released from prison for 10 days. Um, when she murdered uh, Kobe. And apparently she was angry towards her because she had grasped her up, you know, uh, they, that she had said something to the police about her. And while she was in custody, her feelings just 
festered, it says here, which I think is a good descriptive word. You know, her, her resentment, her animosity towards Kobe just uh, festered while she was in prison. Uh, so she'd been less than two weeks out of prison before she murdered Kobe. I mean, for goodness sake, you know, was she so keen to go back into prison or was it just drugs, you know, because she was she was on drugs? Um, so Miss Parfit, Kobe, she'd repeatedly called and messaged her former partner for help, saying she'd been warned of what has been planned. And she said, I am dead if I stay here alone. So that's the terror that she was living through. And she'd packed up her belongings and booked a storage unit two days before her death. But fortunately, she didn't quite get out in time. So apparently on that day, she had asked a neighbour to call the police when she returned home because she found that uh, Shannon Jeffrey and her associates at, associates at her house and they they had spent three day, three hours at the house the day before taking her belongings. And horribly, anything about murder, of course, is horrible, but this is particularly horrible uh, because she said that she had, she told an associate she'd assaulted uh, Kobe. This is Kobe, a mother of four children, a grandmother, as well um and she she told an associate that she'd killed her and then hung up her body to make it look like a suicide so i mean you know we don't know all the details we don't know why she decided that that wasn't working uh and then decided to take her off and dump her in um a mine shaft i don't know why she changed her mind about the suicide thing maybe you know maybe uh Kobe had lots of injuries that weren't consistent with hanging. So maybe in the end, she decided that she would take the body and dump it. So anyway, apparently her, uh, Shannon Jeffrey and her associate returned to the home to wrap Miss Parfit's body in plastic and bedding, fearing that her fingerprints were on her body. Ah, that's why. And they then drove 30 kilometres to Snake Valley near Ballarat where they dumped uh, Kobe's body in a mine shaft. So the guy, he only got, uh, I think he only got a couple of more. He's out anyway now, I think. James Prestige, I think so. I don't think he got a very long sentence because he was sentenced for assisting in her death, of course. He didn't kill her. So eight months it took for this crime to be resolved. But apparently it wasn't until August that her family officially reported her missing which sparked the police investigation which ultimately led to the discovery of um kobe's body in december 2020 and it was phone records from his mobile phone from the the guy that helped shannon uh, dump um, kobe's body phone records from prestige's mobile led police to the snake valley location so in the meantime, this Jeffrey, this woman, Shannon Jeffrey, moved into her property, organised the transfer with the landlord and real estate agent and claimed that Jody, uh, uh, that Kobe had moved to Queensland. And uh, this is nice to see that the Justice Michael Croucher said that her behaviour after the manslaughter, well, they're calling it manslaughter, worsened the seriousness of the offence. So she was arrested in January 2021. So Kobe's mother and two aunts told the court their lives had been shattered by Kobe's death. We've all been living in this nightmare, they said, so you can try to get away with what you've done. So it apparently it was a drug fueled attack, you know. So oh, I expect it was awful, um, you know, when there was, there's drugs involved at like I bet it was frenzied because she had taken menfem oh god methamphetamine meth on the morning she killed uh, Kobe and she, her lawyer said that she wanted to study work and reunite with her daughters after she was released from prison yeah right well you know she's took that away from Kobe 
murdered Kobe, hid her body down a mine shaft. You know, what sort of respect is that for somebody? Uh, whether You know, whatever your grievance with somebody, you know, that's just an awful thing to do, isn't it? Uh, now, we'll look at the sentence now. So let's see, what sentence did she get? Ten years. Oh, come on. Ten years. So what? Ten years in jail for killing a Victorian mother of four and dumping her body down a mine shaft. Hanging her body up to make it look like suicide. Then driving 30 kilometres away to Snake Valley and dumping her body down a mine shaft. She gets ten years. Because, do you know, I think this is part of the reasoning behind uh, Patrick Stevenson's thoughts, is the longer he can leave the body undiscovered, the longer the decomposition and the harder it is to establish cause of death. And I think this is something to do with what happened here. If you can't prove the cause of death, um, it's difficult to prove murder and not manslaughter. And obviously, uh, manslaughter has a lesser charge because I just don't see how this is manslaughter. You know, she's been threatening her for weeks, driving around her house, threatening her, doing all these things, moving into her flat afterwards, telling everybody she's, you know, covering up the evidence. All these things. How can she only get 10 years? You know, I just find that um, disgusting, to be honest. It's disgusting. So, yeah, she, oh, because she, she pled guilty to manslaughter. This is, so this is like, this might happen with uh, Patrick. What he might do is nearer the trial date, etc., which isn't till August. He'll probably wait as long as he possibly can. And then he will say where the body is. And then by the time they recover the body, they won't be able to prove a cause of death. And um, he'll plead guilty to manslaughter. And he'll get a lesser sentence. I'm sure that's all playing in his mind. So even though this judge called it cruel and callous, and he said the cruelty and callousness of Jeffrey's behaviour after the manslaughter aggravated the seriousness of the offence, he still only gave her 10 years. Even though he said after the killing she had oodles of time to reflect on her actions and choose to do the decent thing thereafter. She could have come forward and it might have in some way alleviated the family's suffering. This is just like what we would say to the Twonk Patrick, isn't it? Alleviate the family's suffering. But he's not doing that because he's thinking more of how he's going to get the short. If he only got 10 years, if Patrick Stevenson only got 10 years, he'd only be 32 when he came out of prison. So is that his plan? Is that his plan to hold off saying where the body is for as long as possible for maximum decomposition and then uh, just say it was an accident or, you know, it was manslaughter, plead guilty to manslaughter? Terrible, isn't it? So Miss Parfit's family members released a statement after the court hearing saying that no sentence would bring her home. We are left powerless and voiceless and the trauma and distress continues, the family said in the statement. We will never hold her or hear our, her voice. Today, Sharon Jeffrey has gotten off lightly and our grief remains a life sentence. She bloody has got off. Um, she has got off lightly. So anyway, the, the reason, if you like, if you can think of it as a reason, that she got angry, as we were saying, she got angry towards uh, Kobe while she was in custody serving time for another offence. She had personal items st uh, stored at her home and she believed that Kobe was selling them. And she also held Kobe responsible for her address, uh, arrest. So there's a picture somewhere. Uh, I've got some photos of the perpetrator somewhere. Right, let me just put that down. I need to put... Right, let me just put some uh, windows down. Uh, 
Too many windows open, then I get confused. Oh, let's have a look at this video. So I wanted to show you uh, this video of the t at the time. So when the police were searching uh, for down the mine shafts, etc., this was a video that was on the news at the time, and uh, you know, in December twenty twenty. So let's hope that it won't be long before we'll be seeing a video like this about Samantha's case. The hunt for a suspected murder victim just a few hundred metres from their doors has shocked Snake Valley locals. This is usually a nice, safe, you know, little town. But, yeah, it's a bit scary. The search for 43. It's funny, isn't it, when people say, oh, this is a, a nice, safe little town, nothing ever happens here. These things happen everywhere. Though, to be fair, the actual MUR, DER didn't happen there. That's where uh, they dumped uh, her body. Year old Ballarat woman Kobe Parfit resumed this morning with the search and rescue unit combing through dense bushland along the Pitong Snake Valley Road, covering around two kilometres. For some locals, the news has been hard to process. I'm still taking it in, to be quite honest. It's a uh, nice, quiet little town, you know. So there you go, there again, it's a nice, quiet little town. Like um, St. Michael's, uh, you know, where Nikki sort of came to her unfortunate end for reasons that we're not quite sure of still. Things happen in nice, quiet little towns. And they'll say, although she wasn't actually murdered here, this is where her body was taken and dumped. And it must be a shock for the community, you know. It must be when you live in one of those little places where nothing ever happens, uh, it must be a shock. Yeah, extremely surprising. Detectives have confirmed Miss Parfit was last seen alive at a property on Hickman Street on April 28, where they suspect she was murdered. Police say they're confident they're close to locating Miss Parfit's body. This area has already been searched on numerous occasions, with detectives saying they'll return each time they get a new lead. It's hoped the search will yield crucial answers and give Miss Parfit's family closure. It's sad for the family because they don't know where she is or anything. So hopefully they will find her and, and she'll be safe somewhere anyway. It's all we can hope, isn't it? The search is expected to continue throughout the week. For Shayla Kamara Wansa, Win News. Yeah, so the hunt for a suspected. So now I've got some photos of the, let's see, gosh, I end up with that many windows open. Right, so this is, uh, I'm going to show you now the actual murderer. It's always more startling when it's a woman, isn't it? And this was her friend as well. I mean, she planned this. This is what I don't understand. She planned it. How can she be... Um, how can she only get a 10 year sentence? Because it was planned. Where's the photo? Here she is. Well, that's a better photo of her than some of the ones. So she'd been released from. This is Sharon Jeffrey, who actually murdered um, Kobe. Bashed her. Bashed her and killed her. Hung her in a closet to make it appear. That it took her own life at first and then thought that her fingerprints might be on the body. So they coldly came back. Kobe's body, she had hung up, hung her up in her house as if she'd committed suicide. So what if her children would have seen that? I mean, where were the children? Oh, and she also said uh, Kobe died on her knees begging to be taken to her father's house or to the police and she only got 10 years oh come on this is wrong this is so wrong and then she moved into her property and told everyone that she'd gone off to Queensland so that because of that that's why it was three months before she was reported missing so she obviously had some sort of lifestyle that the family weren't surprised, you know, when she said that she'd gone off to live in Queensland. Maybe she'd done things like that before. But it was because of false rumours spread by her um, that it was three months before they reported her missing. 
And yeah, due to the date, state of decomposition, forensic pathologists were unable to identify how she died. That it just makes me wonder, you know, because that guy, Patrick Stevenson, he, he'll know about this murder. If he's from Ballarat and this is Ballarat, he'll have read about this. He'll know about it, especially if he's got an interest in true crime. You know, if he if he was sort of starting thinking about maybe he'd quite like to, you know, kill someone, uh, which he could have been thinking about it for ages. Um, he'll know about this murder. So is he thinking of that? Is he thinking of that? I'm going to do what Shannon did. Uh, Shannon Jeffrey did in Kobe, Kobe's murder. I'm just going to say nothing until the last minute. And then I'll say where the body is and then I'll admit to manslaughter. Has he learnt from this? So, now, it's interesting that they're saying to locate the mine shaft, police use phone records from Jeffrey's accomplice. Well, the police have said they don't think that there is any accomplice involved now in Samantha's murder. Whereas originally the police did say that they did think there was maybe one or more people, even multiple people was said. But now they're not saying that, but that might be a way of lulling someone into a false sense of security. So I'm sure the police are checking all sorts of phone records and that might be how they end up locating Samantha. Not from Samantha's phone records, not even from Patrick's phone records, but maybe from the phone data of somebody else. They might get an idea of where she is. But I do, you know, I'm starting to feel that um, maybe Patrick has learnt from this because he'll know about it it's in Ballarat. And her, uh, her barrister said the mother has sent a great, has spent a great deal of time thinking about her actions. She struggles to understand why she acted the way she did. Well, because she was drugged up, probably. And it makes her feel awful. She now says she should have been honest with what occurred earlier. Well, do you know what? She can say anything. But what, she was cruel. She was callous. It wasn't in a moment. She took hunger up to make it look like She'd killed herself. She then went back, took the body and hid it. She moved into her apartment. She lied about where she was. Do you know, that is not manslaughter. I don't see uh, in a, a million years how you could think of that as manslaughter. Oh, so she had some supporters in, in court because Jeffrey's supporters, Shannon and Jeffrey's supporters, stood and waved, calling out, I love you, Sharon. Good God, yeah, whatever. Let's have another a look at another picture. So this is her probably as she really is because we saw that other photo of her um, where she looked sort of, you know, she, she. this is this is the face that Kobe saw looking at her when Kobe was begging for her life, begging to be taken to her father's, probably begging to see her children again. That is the face she saw looking at her. And now this woman will be out in 10 years. Uh, well, she's done a year now, probably already. She's probably only got another nine, eight or nine years to go. And she's in prison. And then she'll be walking around Melbourne or wherever she decides to go and live, somewhere around Victoria. So in not, not that um, longer time in the future, this twonkess, this twonkette, will be walking around free. So she's 32, she'll only be in her 40s, early 40s. That's where you see the real her, look in her eyes, look in her eyes that she's not a good person. She's literally got away with murder. Disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. But it makes me wonder, has Patrick Stevenson seen about that case? Sure, he knows about that case. There's no way he doesn't know about it. It's a murder in Ballarat. And um, I'm pretty certain that he will know about that case. Hi, Wesley. So. Hmm. I am having a nice morning. Thank you, Wesley. I hope you are too. 
it is a beautiful day here in Spain. I'm going to get some sun later. I mean, I don't need some phrase. So I've decided I am definitely going to go and try and get some sun. So that was one case that I wanted to talk about. So that's the case of poor Kobe and, you know, prayer for Kobe, prayer for her children, four children, one grandchild, that they'll be grown up without their mother, without their grandma. Uh, and then that, whereas that one case will be out very soon, just ready to do it all over again, probably. Um, who knows? Uh, but you, just, just makes you so angry, doesn't it? I don't know how Kobe's family are coping with it. Cause I, I don't think I could cope with it. You know, I it would consume me. I would like to think I could, you know, rise above it or whatever, but I don't know if I could. And I think I'd be there waiting for when she came out. She'd have to look out for me because if she'd murdered my, you know, uh, loved one um, and she was coming out after that time, you know, I'm I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. I'm just saying now, I think I might feel anybody if it was their family how they might feel, because if you see that at least justice is done and someone gets life in prison, even if they just get a decent sentence, you know, if they don't get the whole life in prison, you know, but twenty years or upwards, but to just get ten years, it just for what she did just seems an insult. It's an insult. Anyway, so the other case that I wanted to talk about that I can see echoes of Samantha's case, uh, not because, again, it's like Kobe's case is completely different from Samantha's case in the reasons, you know, why she was murdered, etc. The similarities was like how long it took to find her body and the fact that the body, well, and it was in Ballarat, of course, the murder, well, not supposed to call it a murder was the manslaughter it was murder um was in Ballarat and then that the Kobe was found down a mine shaft finally so this might you know and I do think there's a correlation there I do feel that Patrick Stevenson will know of that case and that could be one of the reasons why he's just not telling where Samantha is now because he'll just keep it as luck keep that knowledge to himself as long as possible and know that he may only get 10 years because that's what she got, 10 years. So it's not, you know, it doesn't encourage people to tell the truth, 